The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. All right, everyone, welcome into episode three of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. We are getting close to our our goal here for this month of having a thousand subscribers. So please, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to this on audio form, um, head over to YouTube if you don't mind and subscribe to our channel there. We post every episode there as well as the different segments in their entirety and some exclusive drum cam performance content, some lessons, all kinds of stuff over there. So hit up hit up the Drum Factor Direct YouTube channel if you don't mind. All right, this week we have a jam-packed episode. You can see I'm standing. I tried sitting down uh, for the first couple episodes, but I'm back to my standing desk. Best investment I've made for my back health, uh, quite honestly, is having the standing desk. Enough about me. The intro beat this week is was submitted by Ben Helziger. Hel- ben is the co-founder of the Drum Club Project, which is what this beat was created for. He's also the drummer in Eve Six and the drummer in Cannons. He's also artist relations at Big Fat Snare Drum. He's the host and producer of the Big Fat Five podcast. He's also the co-creator of our podcast network, The Drum Click. So busy dude, and um, let's let Ben explain what he's doing in that beat. Hey, what is up? My name is Ben Hilsinger, and I am the host of the podcast Big Fat Five and the co-founder of The Drum Club Project with Mike, for which this video slash audio was used. In this video, I was channeling the live version of the song Upgrade by Pussifer from the live at Arcasanti record played by me and Mike's mutual good friend Gunnar Olsen. The song intro at least focuses on a lot of play between the snare, the hi-hat, and the rim of the rack tom. I'm not sure if the album version was cut up after the fact, but it's got an odd meter implication throughout. So I chopped up the original synth line in the song I played and made it into five distinct measures of 7-4, 5-4, 4-4, 4-4, and 5-4. I know, very exciting. In regards to the kit, it's a classic Maple Ludwig kit with a 5.5 by 14 Pearl Aluminum Elite Snare. Pretty minimal miking with a Telefunken M80 for the snare, Beta 52A on the kick, and an AKG 414 as a mono overhead. And the 414 is doing most of the work here. I did use the feature in Logic to double the drum track on the snare and kick to add a little oomph because my practice space in LA isn't really sound treated. But yeah, hope you enjoy. Thanks, Ben, for sending in that beat. And if you want to get your beat featured in the Drum Candy podcast, shoot just shoot over a download link at, um, you can send We Transfer or Dropbox. Send it over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com and we will get you featured. And you can also include, like everyone has done before, just a brief description about what you're playing, why you're playing it, the gear you're using, all that good stuff. Make sure you introduce yourself, add your website and social media channels and all that stuff will help promote your stuff. I said stuff a bunch of times. Now it is time for a little bit of news. There's a lot of stuff going on in the industry this week. The first thing is a bit of a sad, somber note. The great drummer percussionist Freddie Studer passed away over the weekend. Freddie, not only a great jazz drummer and classical percussionist, but he was also really important in the Peisty product development team from the 70s through the 90s. So pretty much every new product that you would have seen during that time period, he probably had his hands on in developing. So... Our condolences to the Peisty family, Freddie's family, and all of his colleagues and friends. We have a couple new products to make you aware of here at Drum Factory Direct. We just got these up on the site. The first of which is a a bunch of really cool six-ply maple shells with a nice, pretty mahogany veneer. These come in five, five and a half, six, six and a half, and seven inch depth, all 14 inches in diameter. They come pre-cut with bearing edges and snare beds, so you just need to add the holes for your hardware. Maybe put a light oil finish to bring out the mahogany. And that's that. So check those out over on drumfactordirect.com. Again, we have five, five and a half, six, six and a half, and seven by 14 six ply maple shells with a nice mahogany veneer. Check those out. We also just got 
uh, a, some PDP concept Tom lugs. We already had the bass drum lugs on our site, but we just got a bunch of the Tom lugs. So if you have a PDP concept kit that might need some new lugs, go check those out now. They're on our page. The, the product number is PDSP 1014 TD. Again, that's PDSP 1014 TD or the PDP concept Tom lugs. There's a whole bunch of really, really cool records that came out that or at least I just became aware of this week. There were two that I found that have the great drummer, Bill Stewart. Um, one of which is called Jackpot by Brian Corette. That's like a funky organ sax guitar drums ensemble. If you want to hear Bill do that kind of New Orleans groovy soul jazz vibe, that's a great record. Again, that's by Brian Corette and the record is called Jackpot. And he is also appears on a really fantastic duo record called American Ballard with the great pianist Kevin Hayes. That would be a really nice one to check out if you're interested in free improvisation and just the interplay between piano and drums. It's just an absolutely gorgeous record. So again, that is by Kevin Hayes and it's called American Ballad. What else came out? We've got, um, I saw Keith Carlock, the great, great drummer who's currently a member of Steely Dan. He appeared on a new track with the saxophonist Bill Evans and guitarist Robin Ford. The project is called Common Ground. That's kind of more groovy, smooth jazz vibe. So if you're a fan of Keith and that, in that style of playing, go check that out. The Red Hot Chili Peppers, those dudes just never stop. They just dropped a new single, Tip of My Tongue, which is on a new record coming out soon called Return of the Dream Canteen. It's, you know, it's Red Hot Chili Peppers doing what they do. And what else we got here? Lamb of God has a new record coming out and a tour that kicks off here on September 9th in Brooklyn. And that goes all the way through October 20th. So it starts in Brooklyn and ends in Irving, Texas. The main support for that is Kill Switch Engage. And there's a bunch of other uh, great bands that are on that lineup as well, including Animals of Leaders and Baroness. So if you're a fan of new metal, go check that out. Lamb of God's tour. Uh, this start, kicks off here in a couple weeks. Great, uh, great Art Cruz is on drums with Lamb of God. Lastly, there's another record that I just discovered yesterday. It's by the amazing pianist uh, Gonzalo Rubacaba. It's called Trio Diete, and it has the amazing modern drummer Eric Harland on drums. This one has just been blowing me away with just the textures and the sounds. The whole record is almost like a drum feature. So if you want to hear Eric really do his thing, go check that out. That is Trio Diete by Gonzalo Rubalcaba. Now it is time to get back into the super nerdy section of the show. Snare side tuning and how does it affect the sound of a drum? Last week I had the Evans DB1. Uh, actually ended up, it, uh, I should have clarified, I was using the DB1 that's designed for a tom. It has the, the patch in the center and the the muffling ring around it. The one for the snare drum's a little bit different that actually has some built-in um, elements that makes it sound like a snare. Well, we're gonna do a whole review on the Evans DB1 stuff later. But, you know, last week I had the 14 inch Tom head on the drum as the batter side, a normal uh, single ply thin clear bottom on that, on this crazy dial tune snare drum. Not crazy, it's really cool. So then hitting the batter head, would produce minimal sound. So you're really just hearing what the bottom head was doing. And we did the whole tuning range to try to find what sounds good, what gets the best response and try to determine does the bottom head of a snare drum really affect the overall sound of a snare as much as we might think it does. And then I did the same thing with the big fat snare drum mute to get a partially, um, to get the batter head involved a bit, but not um, not fully engaged, so you're still hearing primarily bottom head. This week, I've got just a single ply coated, uh, coated ambassador, which is what came on the dial tune snare. So now we're going to explore, you know, now what happens when the batter head is fully engaged? Does the interaction between top and bottom um, head, and particularly the tuning of the bottom head, how much does it really affect the overall sound of the drum? So let's check it out. All right. Let's go with wide open. So now, now I'm going to get the batter head to the C sharp where I usually start and then explore and then we'll try, you know, different batter head tunes. I want to at least start where I usually start. So let's get this thing to the C sharp. Side note, it's really fun to be able to change the tune of the entire 
head with just a single knob. So um, check out dial tune drums if you haven't checked them out already. But now we've got it at C sharp. I'm going to take the, the bottom head just all the way up. So we're going to start from top to bottom see where these breaking points are. The whole reason for doing this for me was to see if my suspicions of a perfect fourth are the best combination. Um, so far the fourth, reverse fourth was cool and a third was cool. So let's see if that all holds true with the wide open batter head. All right, this bottom head is cranked. I get a little bit more out of it. All right, let's listen to it now. This is wide open, batter head, C sharp. Bottom head is just as high as it can go. Funny. I mean, I could just roll with that and not have to worry about being nerdy, but we're going to be nerdy. So now I'm going to take the bottom head down gradually and just kind of see where it starts to turn to mush. All right, before I go any further, that feels like a nice sweet spot. which I believe that's a fifth. So that is a little even a wider spread than I typically go. But that sounds like a nice sweet spot. Listen to that again. All right, noted. Let's go back down a little bit more. There's another spot where I feel like now I'm getting some kind of complexity that I like, especially when you're playing wide open and if you're going to be hitting harder, uh, the drum is now giving me just a lot more, um, a lot more tone to mess with. What's the relationship? So now the bottom is lower than the top. Minor third, interesting. So now the bottom head is a minor third lower than the top, and that gave me some, just some complexity in the sound that I thought was fun and inspiring. There you go, bottom head being lower than the top. Let's keep going lower. Yeah, now we've gotten into broken drum territory where there's just nothing happening because the bottom head is completely loose. There was something there at, right before I got to that breaking point. I want to see where that was. the relationship is we are at the reverse perfect fourth so the batter head is a perfect fourth above the bottom 
uh, it's not the most responsive sound. It feels kind of like it turned this drum into more of a vintagey kind of almost boxy sound that was fun. Um, so that's something to note, having the bottom head a perfect fourth below your top head, if it's possible, if you're not tuning the top head too high, I mean, or too low, somewhere in the middle, it made this drum sound kind of old and boxy, which can be fun, interesting. I'm Again, I'm experimenting with you. I've never consciously tuned the bottom head lower than the top, and I've found already perfect fourth is cool, minor third is cool. So let's bring it back up and try to find a spot where the drum come that comes to life. See where that is. That, again, what I'm hearing just straight off the mics and at the throne sounds like a, a sound I could deal with you know, all the time. Where's it going to be? Perfect fifth. Interesting. I Again, that wide of a spread I've never consciously gone for, but that feels good with this drum that way. Makes sense, too, because then I could tighten the batter head a bit more and get to that perfect fourth relationship, which I normally like. And that would be, it would give me that familiar response. Um, I don't know about detuning, so let's try detuning the batter head with the bottom head there and see what happens. Let's see where that batter had ended up. Um, I, I feel like whatever the note this is, let's find out with the tune bot what this note is. So the, bo the, the bottom head is even a little bit lower than I normally do. I think it's at an E. And our top head is where? What's the moral of the story? I'm kind of changing my opinions about everything, huh? All right. Uh, so the, the top head still, when I got to the spot where it felt right, C sharp. C sharp over E, though. Interesting. I'm going to leave it at that. So what did I discover for myself? I think I actually like the minor third relationship better, which is going to change everything for me. But I liked the E above C sharp. And then I could tune this down and get the bigger, fatter sounds.
So, but what does the bottom head really do? Um, I'm only noticing snare response more than anything. Lower it is, the less response, the more boxy the drum becomes. Higher it is, the more response, the tighter and the crispier the sound gets. So that's something to think about if you're on a gig or in a room, maybe the snare is just really, really live. Detune the bottom head, see what happens if you can keep your batter head where you like it instead of just throwing a bunch of tape or trying to deaden it up. Uh, detune the bottom head quite a bit and see if that gets the drum to kind of contain a little bit more. Conversely, if the drum doesn't sound like it has any life in a particular room or a gig, crank up the bottom head a bit and see what happens. If you want a more complex sound, try a, a minor third relationship, either, either one higher. If you want just a fuller sound, a perfect fourth or a fifth. And if you want um, an older sound, like a more old school sound, try the bottom head lower than the top. That's a lot to think about. So that's it for this segment on what does the bottom head on a tuning of a snare drum actually do. Um, I might be changing my starting point for moving forward to be C sharp over E. I kind of like that third, a little bit of extra complexity to my ears today on this drum. I'm gonna try it on some other drums, obviously, to see if it translates, but yeah, some things to think about. Um, that's it for what does the bottom snare tuning do to your snare sound. Our featured artist this week is the great journeyman jazz drummer, Andy Watson. He's been, uh, well, you know what? I'm just gonna let Tom Went, who's doing the interview, I'm gonna let him introduce Andy. So let's pass it over to Tom Went. Hey there, folks, Thomas Went back for Drum Factory Direct and very, very honored to be guest hosting the Drum Candy podcast again. Today, we are gonna be talking with uh, one of the great journeyman drummers in this music. The wonderful Mr. Andy Watson. He's had a really wonderful and varied career. He's played with so many of the masters, and we're going to be talking to him about all of that and so much more. So let's get started. All right. We want to welcome everybody to this brand new episode of the Drum Candy Podcast. It's such a pleasure to be back guest hosting. And today we uh, we have a, a very, very special guest, a real journeyman in this music, and uh, a drummer who has been uh, an integral part of the jazz scene for a long time. We're welcoming the fantastic Mr. Andy Watson. Andy, so thank you so much for being here man it's it's a pleasure to talk with you thank you thomas thanks for having me yeah man and uh we actually just saw each other a few days ago we were on the same bill uh playing uh, an outdoor gig right outside of pittsburgh and it was man it was such a such a treat to hear you play with uh with john pizzarelli's seven piece group man i want to get into some of that later on in the episode but man it was such a treat it had been a long time since i had seen you play man Thank you very much, and it was uh, my pleasure hearing you too. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you so much. So, you know, we there there are a lot of different kind of drummers who who check this podcast out. So, in order to sort of loop them all in, are are you from New Jersey originally, or where 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 were you born? I was born in Greenville, South Carolina. Ah, and I I grew up there and uh, went to college at the University of South Carolina. Ah, and then Did I you... moved. I moved to New York in uh, in 1986. Gotcha, gotcha, fantastic. So, as far as the drums go, how did you first pick up a pair of sticks, man? How did how did the drums begin for you? Um, my brother is a is a guitarist, and um, he's nine years older. So, it was always you know music in the house when I you know became old enough to have any awareness and uh they bought us my parents bought a set of drums because my brother was having uh, rehearsals at the house and they had you know it was like the kind of thing to where my brother's uh guitar teachers you know why don't you get andy to play drums so at about five years old i started playing this uh, set of drums wow and it's been all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly relate. I can certainly relate. Wow, that's that's really great, man. So when you after you you sort of started playing around the house, did you did you take private lessons or how 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 did your drum education evolve from there? I started taking lessons at uh, I think I was 
little before I, I turned six, maybe in, you know, a couple months before. So I, I studied with a great rudimental drummer in South Carolina named Harold Wendell. Wow. And I, you know, I, you know, studied with him for years and years. Wow. Yeah. When it when it came to when it came to playing, you know, the whole set, did you did you take drum set lessons for everyone or did you just sort of learn by listening and watching? Uh, there was there's also a really good jazz drummer in my hometown named Sonny Thornton. And when I I guess I got into playing jazz in a, maybe 13 and I saw him out for lessons at that point. And, wow. and of course, I mean, you know, I had, I was lucky enough to have my brother who had, who had uh, made the, the, the leap from being an Allman Brothers fan to, uh, you know, he really got into jazz. So he was feeding me, you know, suggestions for records and, you know, handed me tapes and that kind of thing. Wow. So, who were, who were some of the, who were some of the, the first jazz drummers that you heard that really caught your ear? Could you talk about that? My first three records, I remember um, here again, my brother was home from college. It's like, you need to get some records. So we went to the record store and I bought, uh, it was an anthology of Elvin, that Elvin Jones did on, not, he didn't, it was an anthology of Elvin Jones' work on Impulse. So that was record one. The second one was uh, Miles uh, Fied de uh, Kilimanjaro. Oh, wow. And the third record was uh, Charlie Parker and the Savoy se Sessions. So, wow. so Elvin, Max, and Tony were were the first wow. three guys that I checked out. Man, that's that's a that's a heck of a way to get started. That's incredible. <laughs> and so, after college, did you did you move to New York right away, or did you did you spend some time elsewhere before you got to New York in '86? I went on the road for. About a year and a half. I started out with a, a singer named Buddy Greco. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, Buddy. Okay. And I was with him for about nine months. And then um, I got the call to do Woody Herman's band. Ah. So I did that for about six months. And then uh, after that, I, I moved up to New York in 86. Who was the drummer that preceded you with Woody? Jim Rowe. Ah, okay. Right. But but it was the kind of thing where there had been another guy. It may have been, uh, you know, Dave Miller. I think he lives out on the West Coast now. I, I know the name. Yeah, okay. I think he had done it for, you know, a, a long period of time, and they needed somebody. Rupp had done it, you know, years previous. And it seemed like whenever they were between drummers and needed somebody to just kind of fill the gaps, they would call Jim to, to go back out and play two or three weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Gotcha. Wow, man. So after you arrived in New York in 86, can you talk about some of your early experiences in New York? Who were some of the musicians that you started playing with when you got there? Um, I, in 87 or so, I started working with a guitarist uh, named John Hart. Yeah who is one of my closest friends and uh, I still work with him to this day. Yeah. And uh, also um, the, there was a group called the Bopera House with uh, Tardo Hammer and Ralph LaLama and uh, John Marshall. I did some subbing with those guys and then uh, that led to working some with Peter Bernstein and uh, Larry Goldings. And uh, I guess I, I got the, I, I worked with John Hendricks for about 22 years. And through, yeah. through that, you know, I guess in it was the early, maybe 91, I got the call to go with John. Mm -hmm. Did that. And uh, yeah. How, how far should I go here? Go go ahead, man. Go <laughs> we're, ahead. We're, up to, we're up to 91. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I then did some things with uh, Jerry Braganzi for a year or so. And then uh, I got the call to play with the guitarist Jim Hall. So oh, yeah. I was with Jim for a couple of years. 
then I started working with uh, Tokyo, Toshio. My God, <laughs> Toshiko Akiyoshi's big band. Yeah, I was with her for about five years. Wow, man, that's 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 incredible. You you, you have such varied experience, and I want to I want to ask you about that uh, a little bit later in the in the episode. But let's 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 go back just just a little ways. When you first got to New York, who are who are some of the drummers that you met and saw and became friendly with, and and how did they how did they sort of influence your playing once you got to town? Well. The first night I got here, um, I went down to the Vanguard to hear Mel Lewis, who I had met, you know, the, the previous year. I, I was lucky enough to be invited to a gig he did by uh, a saxophonist, Bob Belden. Bob was the leader, and he hired Mel and Mark Johnson. It was Mel, Mark Johnson, uh, um, Jim Powell, and Bob doing just like some some little gig, you know, we were playing like a cocktail party. Wow. But I got to sit three feet behind Mel uh, for this, you know, four hour gig, which was an amazing lesson. Wow. But anyway, so, um, you know, first night I went down, of course, and it was a Monday, I heard the band. And then I, you know, at that point, Al Foster was playing in New York somewhere, it seemed like every week. So I heard wow. him, I heard Billy Higgins. Um, not that I became friendly with either one. I mean, I, you know, I, I said hello. Sure. And then, you know, guys my age, um, I, I, who did I, who did I hang out with? God. <laughs> it's it, it's been a while so i, I totally yeah. understand <laughs> you know i i you know you're 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 playing you know to me is is one of the things i really like about it is that you 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 have sort of obvious influences like all of us do but and i noticed this on sunday when we were playing you know you you had this beautiful way of of sort of straddling the fence between being able to play sort of with a small groove feeling, but also with 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 sort of the 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 big band concept when that was needed, and I know that 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 was sort of a big part of Mel's concept. Could you talk a little bit about about how that influenced you? Because I could really hear that, and it was a wonderful thing. Uh, that you know that concept has been a huge influence. Um, basically, Mel's Mel's idea about playing with a big band was to play with abandon and you know make the figures but make them sound like they're you're getting there and it's a happy accident <laughs> rather than you know like being real you know nailing things down and that brings a uh, real looseness to his playing that i always was attracted to so that you know that's always you know been kind of the way that i approach things too i don't i don't i'm always going for how can i make a band feel loose like a jazz band i don't want it to sound like a show where everything is is nailed down with you know a hammer yeah I'd rather try to you know give people freedom you know to play their way and we have you know a loose kind of feeling yeah i found that you know you know being judicious in uh the way i handle you know written parts as as you know been a big part of that yeah that's it's 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 a really beautiful concept going back to when you first heard mel at that at that little gig when you got to town could could you talk about because i unfortunately missed him i never got a chance to hear him play live could you talk about some of the things that you noticed that 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 first night you were in town when you went to that gig and you sat behind him for that that whole gig what 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 were some of the things about his playing that jumped out to you um let me just correct the record uh my first night in town i went to the vanguard oh i'm so sorry yeah this, yeah this gig was like the previous year i was just in town like you know for a couple of days or something I gotcha was, yeah um the thing that jumped out to me the most was the way he feathered the bass drum. I, it was an unbelievable thing to witness. Uh, wow. Of course, he, he, he was using a, a lambswool beater, 
and he had the the beater had like a it was so consistent and perfect literally like maybe a, a inch and a half two inch you know range of motion going to the head and um it was just so absolutely consistent it blew mm. my mind wow I, I did notice and this is one thing that i try to pass on to as many you know students as i can he uh watching his foot uh, when he was feathering his whole foot didn't move you only saw like the the front part of his shoe you would see like the section where the toes are going up and down so i know he was only moving his toe inside his shoe and not involving the ankle at all wow so and if you sit down at your drums and and do that you'll find that that two inch distance is about what you know the average shoe will allow your toe to move up and it's perfect if you can get that together you know that gives you you know the, like the perfect volume for doing feathering i mean that's that's the thing you know you've seen this i know you, you try to teach a young drummer about feathering and it sounds like the salvation army you know and i tell them it's like you know yeah Bass players are really going to hate you. If you, if you don't get that under control. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but then my next thing is, all right, now do this with the toe and, and try to get that happening. And you'll see that you get just the right amount of volume. And with the lambs will beater, with, uh, uh, if you have one that's broken in, the, the center of the ball has a, a a ring of lamb's wool that gets worn away from contact and and that leaves a ring of of the wool itself around that center thing so mm -hmm. when, you, when you pull back and want to do an accent something like that you hit it and you get a lot of definition because that center ring that's like naked uh, beater it's the head but when you're feathering the, the ring of wool around that keeps it from being too, you know, keeps the attack from being too definite. Therefore, gotcha. you get, you know, like the thing we were all taught with uh, uh, concert bass drum playing, it's more felt than heard. Well, that's what you get with the you, with this toe technique and, you know, that lambs will, yeah, ring. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I know I know Mel was he was such a master at doing that. And and it is it's such an important part of of what we do. And it's you're right. It's very difficult to teach young drummers sort of, you know, how to do that. And you try to come up with all sorts of analogies and, and whatnot. But it's it, it, it is a very interesting technique that we all need to develop. Um, getting getting back to, you know, your 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 first times seeing mel thinking back to that gig where you were sitting behind him versus hearing him at the vanguard with the full big band could you talk a little bit about how how he used dynamics sort of comparing the two situations that you saw him in well of course the you know he played so much softer on this quartet gig. sure and he had a he, he was using a small uh, drum kit too. It's like his subway kit, I guess. It was uh, okay. One of the ones. It might have been one of the first ones they made where they were the the drums were hinged, so he, the bass drum came apart and everything else went inside. So he he's got like two cases. Anyway, smaller drums, a smaller sound versus the Vanguard where he had you know the uh, twenty inch bass drum and uh, you know much. You know, much much fuller kind of thing, obviously, because you're playing with a big band. Uh, uh, the first time I went to the, the Vanguard, and this is another story I spread as much as I can. Um, I'll never forget. We got there a little late. We had driven up from South Carolina and gotten there, you know, like at, at ten thirty, and they started at ten, and <clears throat> they were playing an arrangement of Cherokee. And I walking down those stairs and hearing that bass drum of his making those big hits, it was like the Pied Piper. I mean, it wow. just it just came up of those stairs and you just like wanted to grab onto it and let's like, hey, let's go down here. Wow. An amazing sound. An amazing wow. Sound. 
as as somebody who has played a lot with that band in the vanguard which which you have how how um would you say that 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 his dynamics in the vanguard were just overall were were was he was he hitting the drums pretty hard or was he or was it real sort of was it real sort of floaty up you know up and down as far as the you know his overall volume went um hitting the drums pretty hard interesting and that's one of the things that when i first started subbing with that band um dick oates and earl gardner was playing lead trumpet at the time it's like you know your volume your dynamic range is like this our dynamic range is like this so it's something about that room now with the carpeting and the curtains that you know they as a drummer i mean of course you play with brushes for the balance and things you're playing very soft but just generally on the other kind of tunes the dynamic range is not that much from me compared to what it is with the horn section ah okay Interesting. right so the idea is and um it's one thing before i i played the first time riley it's like listen you're gonna think that you're playing you know too loud but the comments i get after guys come in here it's like he didn't play strong enough interesting so the idea is not to let the bottom fall out right got you and let us take care of you know you do it with us but within a certain you know range and leave the rest of it to us yeah yeah wow that's yeah each each room presents you know all, all these different uh you know uh constraints and we you know we're constantly right. dealing with all of that yeah that's that's really interesting you know and that's another before before we go further that's another yeah. too with the club i remember um whenever jerry dodgen we were lucky enough to have him play lead alto um i would always give him a ride home you nice. know, because i love to hear him well i i really love jerry but i love to hear him talk but <laughs> i remember asking him you know it's like what was the band like at the beginning you know what was the room like it, did mel's playing get you know stronger as time went on he goes, yes he goes, but at the beginning there was no carpet anywhere oh wow and the 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 curtains behind the bandstand were made out of like a thin kind of muslin so you know it, once they started putting carpet into place and now that the, the curtains are like a heavy kind of velvet thing then that you know i mean that eats up some of of your sound so it changed you know the i know it changed mel's approach because you know jerry told me that wow that's very interesting and yeah i mean makes makes perfect sense um one of the things i i wanted to ask you about in, in terms of mel and his whole concept i'm sure you've seen the uh the smithsonian video uh from the early 80s and th those great little interview segments with him and i remember seeing that when i was younger and when he talks about getting underneath the band and the band sitting on his lap that that was one of the first real insights into his playing that you know that i i got and and it made a lot of sense to me but it's really hard to do <laughs> so i was wondering right. if you if you could talk a little bit about that because you were doing exactly that on sunday with that seven piece group you had this beautiful it was like the band was sitting on your lap and it, it sort of jogged my memory back to uh to first hearing that could you you talk a little bit about that that whole thing uh i'll be happy to <laughs> um, uh sitting on your lap and i think that means both sonically and rhythmically uh from a sonic standpoint um you know we're talking about feathering the bass drum earlier that's really important especially with a long a larger group to have your whole body locked in with where this coronal pulse is going. Not just the hands, but the feet too. I mean, that, you know, even though we're talking about it's more felt than heard, that puts a, a bottom on things. And it's really important, especially if you do like a really slow kind of walking ballad or, you know, or a slow swinger, you gotta have that bass drum in there just to, you know, tie everything together. So that's part of it. Also, um, your choice of 
symbols as far as matching up, you know, and providing a, a space for the soloist and the band. The whole band's playing. You want a deep sounding cymbal to get underneath things. And I found that um, reading, you know, things online, people talk about, I need a cymbal to cut through the big band. I need a, I need a symbol that's going to cut through. So you're talking about like a, a, a thicker old A that's really bright. No, that's exactly wrong. But what because what you're going to be doing with an instrument like that, you're you're on top like a, like a, a laser beam, rather than a symbol that's low pitched with some body to it. You're like this. You're like a Klieg light. So mm. you know. You've got the lower overtones, you've got the higher ones, and that really helps to frame the whole band that you're playing with. It also makes, I mean, if the same drummer can play his ride cymbal beat on, on cymbal A, the you know, the thick one, high pitch one, and cymbal B, the low pitch, you know, one with some watch, and it's gonna feel different. It's gonna the beat is gonna feel bigger on that lower pitch cymbal. So that's what you want. Hmm. Also, with uh, with various instruments, it's really important to uh, try to pick a cymbal to play behind a soloist that stays out of like the general range of that instrument. Like I have, you know, a higher pitch cymbal that I use to stay, say, above the trumpet player or above the you know the general range of the piano player. I have another one that sits just, you know, above like a tenor player. So I'm out of his wheelhouse, you know. So yeah, it's really important as drummers it, that you know your particular instruments. But also when you're playing behind somebody, really check out like where does the pitch and the general tonal character of this cymbal sit versus this instrument I'm playing behind. Yeah. I've got certain symbols that don't work with guitar well. They just don't because they're right there where most guitarists play. Yep. You know, or, or, you know, like a, you know, my, the main ride that I use generally with a big band doesn't work behind a trombone player because it's right dead in that range that they play in a lot of the time. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of thing is important to, you know, we, we, I, I view what we do as like a picture frame. You know, hmm. we're the frame around the picture. Wow. So, you know, let them have the middle. We do the edges. Wow. That's, I've never heard it put that way. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it is, as far as you, you mentioned that, um, you know, you want the band to sit on your lap, both sonically and rhythmically. Could you talk a little bit about, about what you mean by rhythmically sitting on your lap? Um, I like, I aim for the middle of the beat. Yeah. You know, I, and I want my beat, I've, I've always tried to have as wide of a beat as possible. Yeah. But if you have a wide beat, same thing we're saying about, you know, a wide range for a symbol. You have a wide beat, there's a lot of space to put things in. You can fit a lot of different rhythmic concepts from an ensemble or a soloist. Yeah. A wide beat is really forgiving. You know, if you're always on top, for instance, and you've got a soloist that plays maybe a little behind the beat sometimes, or you know, it's there's going to be a, a, a tension there that you know, little tension in music, of course, is great, but if it's a constant thing, that's a drag for everybody, big time, yeah, and especially and, and, and especially with uh, an ensemble because you've got you know 13 guys over there, every one of them has a slightly different rhythmic clock. So you have to have room for that to fit in. You can't expect everybody to be exactly on the point of the quarter note at the same time all the time. Yeah. yeah. So that's my, you know, that's the thing. I, I try to play with a wide beat and I play down the middle. If a guy is uh, playing behind me, I, the worst thing in the world I could do, but it's the thing I... I used to do as a young man, and I've heard a lot of drummers do it, is try to pull that guy along. You know, you, no, all you're doing is making a problem 
much more of a problem. Right. That's right. It, it, it doesn't work. You, you, you play your time and let them play over the, you know, around you. Okay. They play yeah. behind you. You're still here. You know, they, uh, a great soloist who can ma manipulate where he plays on the beat, you know, Yep. You know, it's like that's like a rubber band. They stretch, they come back to you, meet up at the right point. At some point to where you know, you know, okay, do what you want. We're gonna we'll be together again. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or there are guys who just don't, you know, or play behind the beat all the time, play in front of the beat all the time. They're guys who just hear it that way. So yeah. you know, you can do that. I, I'm trying to accommodate you and keep everybody else straight. You yeah know, by by you know just being a, a you know big picture kind of guy i think that's that's how you get that done we will go back we will finish up our interview with andy next week but for now we're going to jump over to the education segment we're going to let tom take the the reins here again this is the third part of his jazz drumming essential series this week he's talking about the ever important ride symbol Hey folks, Thomas Went back with you again for Drum Factory Direct. This is part of our ongoing series on some of just the basic fundamentals of playing jazz music on the drum set. This is our third lesson, and today we are going to be focusing in on the all-important ride cymbal beat. Probably one of, if not the most important aspect of playing this music on the drums. Now. It's a very, very personal thing playing the ride cymbal, and the beat that we all use today sort of developed throughout the course of the music's history. And in the late 1930s, earliest 1940s, drummers went from playing the time on the snare drum and the hi-hat over to a top cymbal or a ride cymbal, what it's most commonly called today. And it's a very, very personal thing. You can tell all of the great drummers in this music just by how they play the symbol. You don't really need to hear them play anything else. That's how personal it is. Now the basic beat that we use is really fairly simple. Sticking in basic 4-4 four, four time for now, it's simply a quarter note followed by a dotted eighth, then a sixteenth note, another quarter note followed by another dotted eighth and sixteenth note. So if we play it very, very slowly on just the symbol, it sounds something like this. Now that might sound and look pretty simple, but there's a lot more that goes into playing the ride cymbal than just playing that simple pattern over and over again. Remember, this is all about feel and sound. What kind of feeling are you generating out of the cymbal and what kind of sound are you getting out of the cymbal, okay? And in addition to that, you wanna make sure that your cymbal beat is consistent and consistent over all dynamic ranges whether you're playing pretty loud or very, very soft and anything in between, you want your beat to be consistent. You want your cymbal beat to have a good weight to it. Not that it's heavy and plodding, we don't want that, but you want your beat to have meaning, if that makes sense. Now, if you're brand new to this, if you've never played any music like this before, the way that I would suggest you start working on it is get your metronome out and set it to a nice slow tempo, similar to the one I just demonstrated at, and just play along with your metronome, just that basic beat until that starts to feel comfortable. After that feels comfortable at that slow tempo, then add your hi-hat nice and strong on beats two and four, and if you can, add your bass drum on all four beats at a nice light feathering volume, just like we talked about in the last lesson. Now, there are a lot of ways, after you get comfortable with the basic pattern and you can play it consistently, there are a lot of different ways that you can work on your cymbal beat and develop it. Personally, I really learned how to do this by practicing with recordings. All of the classic recordings in the jazz canon featuring all manner of the great masters. That's how I would, I would suggest that you work on it. Now, recently, I had the chance to talk with the great modern-day master, Lewis Nash, 
and I asked him how he developed his cymbal beat. And this is just some of what he had to say. Check this out. I used to just set up a ride cymbal only, and I would play along with Jimmy Cobb uh, on the Miles Davis recordings, like Live at the Black Hawk, um, uh, the Kind of Blue, of course, anything that had Jimmy Cobb, because I, there was something about the feel that he had that I was trying to emulate at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I felt like, if I could capture that part, it was that, that prominent aspect of keeping time on the drum set and jazz, then all the other stuff would come. I, I could get that. But that feeling that happens on that symbol is, is what oftentimes gets people phone calls for gigs. <laughs> that know, is true. At least, from, at least from our chair in the, in the jazz situation. So um, that's one thing. And not only Jimmy Cobb, I did it with, with Kenny Clark. Um, I did it with... Um, Philly Joe with Max, just, just checking out how the master drummers, Roy Haynes, what, what they were doing, the, the subtle differences in their approach to um, timekeeping on a cymbal. Then those subtle differences would have to do with touch, would have to do with spacing, would have to do with um, that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then I would experiment with where on the cymbal in terms of pl where you place the bead while you're keeping time, uh, where on the cymbal allowed me to um, hear the sound back in a way that I liked hearing back. So, I mean, so I was experimenting with those kind of sonic things early on. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a technique thing. It, it is in a way, but I was really checking out what the sound that was coming back at me and how that, how I, um, could compare that to the sound I was hearing coming from these records of these great players who I like. Okay, so after you've gotten comfortable playing this basic pattern on the cymbal, along with the hi-hat on two and four, and a nice light feathering bass drum on all four beats, after you get comfortable with that, you can begin to start to vary the rhythm that you use on the cymbal. Now this is where the real artistry comes in, because this is when you can sort of interject your personal style into just playing the cymbal. Now, I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to give you an example by starting out just playing that basic pattern, and then I'm going to vary it just a little bit. Check this out. Okay, I hope you could see and hear the difference between just the basic pattern and then when I was varying it. This has a lot of power within the music. The way you phrase that cymbal beat can have a really profound effect on the rest of the group that you're playing with and therefore the overall effect of the music the group you're playing in is having on the audience. Now to give you guys more of a real world and actual performance example, Here's a clip from a gig that I played recently. Check this out. Okay, I hope that gave you guys a little bit more insight into what I've been talking about during this lesson. Now, at the beginning of the lesson, I mentioned that playing the ride cymbal is a very personal thing, and it really is. And I think the only way that all of us find our voice and our personal style playing this cymbal is by listening to all of the greats that have come before us, men and women who really developed this music and created this entire style. 
by listening to them, by playing along with their recordings, we really will be able to develop not only a good feel and a good sound, but ultimately our own way of doing it. Never be afraid of those influences. Influences are leading you to your personal style. But it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. And you really got to be in it for the long haul. You know, I remember way back in 1997, I think it was, December of that year, I had the great experience of listening to the Grandmaster Billy Higgins, now the late great Grandmaster Billy Higgins, at the Village Vanguard in New York City. He was playing with Jackie McLean, Cedar Walton, and David Williams. And I was sitting very close to him, right up on that back red bench in the drummer's seat, as it's known, at the Vanguard. And Master Higgins had the entire band just levitating, all from the feeling of his cymbal. The sound and feeling of his cymbal was just all through the music. And it was really one of the most joyous and uplifting experiences that I've ever had. And I think of that experience all the time, and I think about the feeling that he produced from his cymbal and how that affected the music. We have a lot of power and influence in this music when we play it. And we want to make sure that we're influencing the music in a really good, positive, and beautiful way. And I think the way to do that is to listen to these great masters, to play along with their recordings, and to not be afraid to be influenced by them. It's a really, really wonderful journey. It takes a long time, but it's worth every, every bit of your effort. And hopefully one day, both you and I will be able to have the same kind of wonderful influence over the music that Master Higgins had way back in 1997. So until then, please continue to listen to this music, play along with these great masters, and as always, stay safe and stay close to the music. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. For the Shop Talk segment this week, we're kicking off a little mini-series here, a slightly different slant on the concept. We're not talking about drum gear, but we're talking about the most important piece of gear, which is your body. I've got my good friend Brandon Green, who's a fitness expert and a, and a great drummer, who um, I worked with him several years back when I was still working for Modern Drummer. He wrote a bunch of great articles for us there. So I wanted to revisit the concept of body mechanics, drum mechanics, if you will, ergonomics, how to set up the kit to not hurt yourself, all this kind of stuff. So we're gonna do a bite-sized chunk here. So here's part one of drum, drum mechanics with Brandon Green. So everyone, my name is Brandon Green. Uh, I'm actually, I'm professionally a fitness professional. I've been working in the fitness and health industry for 17 years. Uh, I have an expertise in biomechanics and helping with motor control. And so professionally, what I do is I work with the most sensitive demographics, people who have major injuries, structural changes, diseases, things that are just stopping them from doing what they love. So instead of just being like the common personal trainer that you've heard of with a whistle and a tank top and flexing my muscles, I really focus on trying to create progression and progression plans essentially to identify where someone's weakest areas are and help them create exercises to build up strength, endurance, and rate and force development so they can get back to doing what they love, which commonly leads me working to a lot of professional athletes and then seniors. One of the reasons why I love working with drummers so much is I am a passionate drummer. Hobbyist drummer, 100%. Hobbyist professional drummer, maybe. But one of the things that drives me nuts is that so many incredible drummers like us, more you than me, Mike, honestly, have messaged me saying, listen, my back is hurting so bad from playing the drums. I have to stop playing the drums because my back is hurting from playing the drums. And that just drives me nuts. And so that kind of prompted me to take some of my expertise in active range of motion, strength exercises, potentiation, all these other weird nerdy things and figure out, well, how can we share that information with drummers? More or less with my goal to try and help drummers keep playing forever because essentially we have this incredible mechanical body and we can use this thing to play this incredible instrument. We need to make sure the machinery is working well so we can actually take the car on the track. And so I'm just trying to do everything I can to kind of give back and help. All right, so before we dive into how to prevent injury, what would be the first thing you would tell someone who has 
a sore back or even a herniated disc or something of that sort? Yeah, it's a super great question. And it's, as you can imagine, there are so many answers. In fact, the client I was just with has a herniated disc. First and foremost, if you have a sore back, a painful area in your body, the first thing I would recommend is try to identify what positions are uncomfortable and what positions are not. And that might not even be necessarily drum set related. But if you're sitting down at the drum throne and you notice my back's killing me when I sit a little lower, maybe raising the drum throne up might actually help a lot. There's something that we're going to reference a few times today, and I call it the Goldilocks zone. And it comes back to the hernia, the disc, and the back pain. Planet Earth is in this beautiful habitable zone where if we go too close to the sun, we're going to melt and get incinerated. If we go too far away from the sun, we're going to get cold and have problems. So we're in this beautiful middle area. Well, all of our range of motions kind of have this same thing, how our body moves. When I'm sitting here, my posture is in this nice neutral position and I can extend back as far as I possibly can and go forward as possibly as I can. And those two extremes, if I go too far one way, I get too hot. If I go too far one way, I get too cold. When we have acute pains, that field between hot and cold gets increased. And so basically we have to find which positions can we be in that don't hurt. And that's tough as drummers because in some cases, if we have a sore back, sitting on the throne alone can really be a problem. So first and foremost, try and figure out where it hurts. Second, the simplest thing as a blanket advice, and I would say first and foremost, go see a doctor for this, is if your back is hurting on the back side, which is such a cheesy thing to say, instead of stretching and really trying to put your finger in the sore, painful area without the professional aid of a professional support person, try to exercise the front. There's this incredible thing called common drive and co-activation. So if you have a sore back, if you exercise the front of your body, it actually creates this nice nerve connection that can actually help the backside feel better and move a little bit easier. I hope that helps. There's just so many different things we can do. But honestly, I mean, the best medicine is prevention when possible. All right. So let's talk about the first step. Like, What is the number one thing for a drummer to consider? regarding their setup or posture or ergonomics like what you know where do you start what's ground zero ground zero in my opinion is has to be the drum throne because okay. it's just such a familiar area i mean we sit in chairs car seats go on the toilet drum thrones i mean ultimately where we, where we put our butt and the height we choose is huge and that comes back to that goldilocks zone when we think of just the seated position that we are in i know you're standing right now but being in the seated position my hips are close to 90 degrees and when I think about that Goldilocks zone of motion, right, when I'm standing up, my leg is completely straight and I'm in this kind of like nice neutral area. I can balance on my leg for a long time. When I lift my leg up, kind of like this, if you're watching the video where I just pulled my knee toward my chest, that's as high as my joint can go, just like 110 degrees of hip flexion. Well, if I'm already at 90 degrees, that means I'm pretty close to the sun. I'm pretty close to an extreme of motion. So if I can find a way to assess that and make sure that I have extra range of motion. I'm kind of in the Goldilocks zone more than closer to the sun. That's the best. So if anyone's listening to this, like as far as drum throne getting started, sit on your drum throne, find a comfortable position, make sure you're seated in the middle of the throne. And then what I want you to do, place the snare drum between your knees. So you've got the right distance of where your legs are going to be before we put pedals down. Take your knee, draw your knee toward your chest as high as you can, and then do the same on the other side. If you can actually lift your foot up a good two inches and you're comfortable, your throne's probably in a pretty good spot. If you're playing really low and you can't lift your leg up at all, or it feels really, really tough and it gets sore and pinchy, we got to raise that throne up because we're too close to the sun. I don't know. Does that help, Mike? Yeah. Now, what happens if you go the opposite and you sit too high? That's a super great question. And actually, it's kind of a common thing. So when we get to that higher, taller position, what ends up happening is our body has to try to find a way to maintain our center of mass. And so this gets a little weird. And I'm going to see, I'll see if I can do this with, with pens. So when we're seated, most of us are sitting at like a 90 degree angle of our knees, maybe 110 degree angle. Well, if we get up to that higher end where we get close to 45 and zero of our actual hip, we actually almost start putting weight down through our feet and almost in a half standing position. I've seen a lot of shorter drummers have to end up doing this. Like my wife's 5'2", and she'll try to play the drums, which she's stupid good for someone who's never plays, which is not fair. But I'll raise the throne up for her, and she gets this position where she's almost standing. What starts to happen is when you get to that tall position, 
and we have to use our hands to reach forward to hit most of our drums, like ride cymbals, rack toms. When we put our arms in front of us and we're tall, we have to actually find a center of mass. So if I'm sitting here and I reach my arms out in front, I have to almost lean back a little bit to maintain my center of mass over top of my bum, or I start leaning over the drum set. What ends up happening is if you sit too high, simply like sound bitey, if you will, your body is going to start finding motion at other joint systems. It's either going to extend your lower back more, it's going to make you lean back a little too far, or it's going to make it really, really awkward for pedal mechanics. So if you can, my best advice would be find a comfortable position, but find a position where the majority of your mass is actually on the throne. So if you're doing stuff with your feet, you don't feel like you're in this kind of like gingerbready back and forth style motion. Does that mean sitting further back in most cases on the seat? Too many people sit up on the edge. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I, a lot of people sit up on the edge. And for certain gigs, you can kind of get away with it. Like if you're playing like a pretty slow rock gig and you're like doing just a bass drum note every few BPM, like that's fine. But if you're doing anything that has any foot syncopation whatsoever, it gets to this point where if you're leaning too far forward, it's going to start making your lower back do a lot of side to side motions way more than if your weight is back just a little bit. I wouldn't say lean back all the way, but if you get get to a point where you're sitting on your throne with a tall posture and it feels comfortable, you'll notice when you put your arms in front of you, you're going to have to lean back like I just mentioned, but that little bit of leaning back because of reaching in front works well. Honestly, I mean, comfort and the range of motion assessment we just spoke about are going to be the two of the best barometers in my opinion. So the the summarize is between 90 and 110. Is that what you said? Is kind of the sweet spot for most people? I would say I would say between 100, like at the hip, the hip flexion angle, between 100 degrees and 130 degrees. If we get over the 130, we start getting to that standing. I think 90 looks cool. It's kind of the sound bitey thing. Like every drum throne YouTube video will get say get to a 90 degree angle. Most of us don't have much more than 100 degrees of hip flexion. So if you're at 90, you're already there. So let's call it 100 to 130 as a sound bitey thing, in my opinion, so far. Okay, let's talk about actual seat. Salt versus firm, round versus, you know, motorcycle style, big, small. Like, what what do you find to be the ideal? Yeah, super great question. Uh, a couple things, and there's one that you might attack me for, and I'll come back to it within a second. Uh, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a gigantic fan of any form of throne that doesn't modify how you have to sit on it. I'm a big fan of round just because it's extremely simple and our legs can drop down and move around it pretty well. There are some motorcycle thrones, which I can't recall the brand off the top of my head. So please don't shoot the messenger with this one. Uh, but those are also quite fine. Um, there are certain versions of companies that have tried to make versions of the Carmichael throne where they use materials that are not as strong and as robust as they need to be, which can actually have a slight negative effect with how the position of the back is. Um, short note, I would say looking on the material end, one of the best things you can do is get the firmest throne that you can tolerate. And the reason why is if you think about I mean, coming to a bed, right? When people pick a bed, you know, everyone's talking about like whisper soft, Casper soft mattresses. Well, if you think of like the geometry of a person, like if you got someone who is like a standard American male with a bit of stomach, you know, not a lot, but a little bit more weight in the midsection, long legs, what's going to happen is when you sit on that mattress or you lay on that mattress, wherever the most amount of weight you have is where the mattress will dent in. And then your body has to change shape around that dent to work around it. So if someone's got a huge boil, I'm exaggerating, of course, huge boiler of a stomach, it dents in at the boiler, and then you end up this bowing if you're laying on your side or stomach around the boiler stomach. Well, the drum throne is kind of the same idea. If you are an um, um, a average 170-pound male, 130, 140-pound female, and you've got a really, really soft throne that feels so good when you first sit on it, the upholstery and the actual fabric is going to change shape based off of you, which feels comfortable at first. But over time, it also means that since it has, unless it's really great quality, that amount of give, it will, as you sweat, moisture, the material will change shape over time and turn almost to like a Birkenstock style thing that changes to your hips and glutes. But again, might feel good, but also might force you into positions over time that are not comfortable. The firmer of a throne you can have, the more your body gets to change shape 
as it will, if you will. Your body fat tissue, your muscle will go where it wants to go. So to summarize, I think a flatter, firmer throne when applicable is the best case scenario. There are some specific scenarios, like if someone has um, any sort of structural stuff, like with the, the actual tailbone or the sacrum has got some issues, or if you've got anything going on structurally where you need that space and you need to have that the cut in the middle or a motorcycle style throne, those are all great options, but flatter and firmer is better in my opinion. We only have one listener question this week. If you have any questions you would like to send into the show, please send them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. You can send them as just an email. You can send it as a video or an audio question. Just anything you want about gear or drumming technique or practice or, you know, something about the industry or anything, anything at all, um, shoot it over. Or if you have suggestions for future topics for the show, shoot them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. So this week's listener question comes in from Jeff Costello in Atlanta, Georgia. My question is, how do brass hoops affect the sound of toms? Does the metal that tom hoops are made from matter at all? Or is it all about the weight and rigidity? Great question. Um, I'm not going to go super deep into this because this is absolutely going to be a segment of the show um, very soon. Uh, we're focusing mostly on snare drums for a while, but I might take a divergence and do the tom thing first um, just to kind of wrap this question back into it. I actually have a brass hoop here. We have a, a batch of, of brass hoops at Drum Factor Direct in a bunch of different sizes, mostly for snare drum, but this is a six lug 12 inch hoop solid brass chrome solid brass now would i use this on toms i have a hypothesis so we're gonna we'll end up checking this you know once i do the demo once i swap it out because i'm going to put this on i have a, a maple 12 inch drum that currently has 2.3 steel triple flange so this is a basically the brass comparable version of that 2.3 solid brass might be 2.5 i have to look up the the actual size of these but these are the hao7s um, if you want to snag some over at drumfactordirect.com you might want to do that soon because these are limited and once they're gone they're gone now here's my hypothesis about toms i don't think the material of the hoop matters as much unless you are playing a ton of rim shots i think because you can hear that it's a very resonant sound so it's going to vibrate every time you hit the drum in a, in a pretty musical way. You might not actually hear it vibrating, you, but there is some element of that vibration that, that takes part into this, in the sound. They're a little bit softer than steel, so there's that. Um, are they heavier? I would say they're probably about the same weight as steel. Um, now here's my thought though. I don't think, because these aren't cheap, I don't think putting these on your toms is going to be as drastic of a difference as putting these on a snare drum, which you're hitting rim shots. Your snare might be made of metal. So all that kind of plays a little bit more. Um, I think for toms, you're just thinking like lighter, thinner versus lighter, thinner with flexibility versus heavier and denser that are more rigid as far as what it might do to contain the, the sustain and offer a little bit more bite or more open sound um so my hypothesis is you're not going to hear a huge difference on a tom if you just go from a triple flange steel to a triple flange brass if you go with the single flange brass that's going to make a big difference because it's much lighter it's much more flexible conversely if you go to a die cast that's going to be a huge difference so we'll do this actual test maybe next week on the 12 inch tom um, but I, I personally wouldn't invest all that money to put brass hoops on toms. I would focus it on my snare drum collection primarily. All right. So again, if you have any questions for the show, shoot them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Thanks, Jeff. And we'll come back to this soon. For this week's warehouse pick of the week, it is the new DFD practice pad. This is, we're calling this the pro pad. So if you're searching for it on the site, you can search for pro pad or to be under the practice pads tabs, just look for the Drum Factor Direct branded version. This is a two-sided pad, eight inch wood uh, base that's been curved a bit on the edges, painted black. 
It's got the traditional hard rubber black side, and then it's got a thick closed cell foam side on this side with a little bit of fabric on top. So this gives you a quieter, softer feel versus the more traditional bouncy rubber. I personally use this side often. It feels more like if you're playing on an actual drum versus this feels like you're playing on a piece of rubber. They both have their purposes, obviously. Um, but yeah, this this really, you can see it's pretty thick foam, closed cell. It's a really nice practice pad. Uh, we got a whole bunch of these in. So if you're, you know, you just make good gift items or if you just need something for traveling for yourself, it's only, again, it's only eight inches and it can go into a, a shoulder bag or a backpack really easily. Now we're also throwing in a pair of, these are our house brand DFD 5B sticks made from premium hickory. They're not cheapy sticks. They're not throwaway garbage bin <laughs> sticks. These are premium 5B sticks that we are given to you free if you buy one of these pads. Just make sure you get there. On the site, you'll see there's a pro pad with sticks in the images, and then there's another version of the pro pad without the sticks. But it's the same price. So you might as well get the free pair of sticks. Again, it's a great gift item, or if you just need something for yourself, go check it out. This is the DFD pro pad, two-sided pro pad on drumfactordirect.com. All right, that's it for this week's episode. Appreciate you listening, checking it out. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button and like it if you do like the show and share it if you don't mind sharing it over on your Facebook page or wherever. And if you're only listening to this in audio form, uh, head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe there for the video version of this and a bunch of other stuff. And also, if you don't mind giving us a five-star rating and writing a review into the whatever app you get your podcast deliveries, that'd be much appreciated. It gets this show into the ears of more drummers all around the world. Can't thank you enough for the support. The new format, I believe, is starting to take shape, although... I, if I had to admit how many times I had to redo some of these segments, it would be quite embarrassing. But anyway, we're going to let Ben uh, Hilzinger, Hilzinger, I can't even say my friend Ben's name right. Ben Hilzinger, Hilzinger, take it away, Ben. See you next week.